come today, gather as the Ohana, the family, with the great recognition of our need for you. <laughs> Lord, apart from you, we are nothing. We can do nothing. So Lord, we realize how desperately we need you, not just for our eternal life, but for every moment of every day in this life. So Lord, here we are, we come, we gather. We turn our hearts and our minds and voices toward you in worship and praise, desiring, Lord, to learn of you, that we in turn might become more like you. Let it be so, Lord, we pray in the precious name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, we ask, and all God's people say, amen, amen. amen. Please be seated. Amen and amen. Well, let's open our Bibles to John chapter 21, shall we? John chapter 21. Uh, last time we were together, we looked at three things after the resurrection of Jesus Christ in John 21. Uh, we've looked at the appearance of the Lord. Uh, we've looked at the provision by the Lord. And we looked at fellowship with the Lord. We saw how Jesus appeared to these seven disciples who were out on the Sea of Galilee fishing. They, of course, caught nothing. Jesus said, cast your net on the right side of the boat, not the wrong side. So they cast it on the correct side of the boat, caught 153 large fish, which, of course, was the provision by the Lord. And then the fellowship. Man, Jesus invited them to come to shore. And he provided food for them. Not their food, but his food he provided for them. Setting the stage for what they were, will be about to do. So we've looked at the appearance of the Lord, the provision by the Lord, and fellowship with the Lord. Now, as we come to verse 15, we're going to be looking at service to the Lord, service to the Lord. So let's pick up our reading in verse 15 of John chapter 21, reading down through verse 25, the end of the chapter. John chapter 21, beginning in verse 15. So, when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. Now this he spoke signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. Well, then Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following, who also had leaned on his breast at the supper and said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, but Lord, what about this man? And Jesus said to him, if I will that he remains till I come, what is that to you? You follow me. And then this saying went out among the brethren that this disciple would not die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he would not die, but if I will that he remain till I come, what is that to you? Now, this is the disciple who testifies of these things and wrote these things. And we know that his testimony is true. And there are also many other things that Jesus did, which if they were written one by one, I suppose that even the, the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen, amen and Amen. 
Now, as we've mentioned, this final section of John 21 deals with our service to the Lord. And for you note takers, you outliners, there are four things we want to look at. Four areas that deal with our service to the Lord. Number one, the first thing involves love. Love. Uh, That's in verses 15 through 17. And the point is very simple. Our service to the Lord must flow from our love for the Lord. And Jesus illustrates this very important point with three questions. Three questions in verses 15 through 17 dealing with love. Take a look. In verse 15, the question, the first question in verse 15 is after breakfast. It says when they had eaten breakfast, after Jesus fed those seven disciples there on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, after his resurrection, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? Now here's the first of three questions. Simon Peter, do you love me more than these? Now Jesus uses the word agapeo for the word love that's used here. It's used 142 times in the New Testament. It's the verb form of the word agape. It means a selfless love, a sacrificial love, a supreme love. And the question is, Pete, do you love me supremely? Do you love me spiritually? Do you love me perfectly? In fact, Jesus adds this little phrase, do you love me supremely? Do you love me more than these? These what? Well, this demonstrative pronoun is in what's called the genitive case, indicating that it can be looked at as a plural feminine, a plural masculine, or a plural neuter, either way. So this question, this interrogative can be looked at in two ways. First of all, as it pertains to the plural masculine, Jesus is saying, Peter, do you love me more than these men? Do you love me more than you love these men? Or it could be looked at, do you love me more than these men love me? We're not sure. The the grammar is transitional. It can be looked at in a couple of different ways. The point here is simple. Peter, do you love me more than people in the world than these men, we might say, which becomes very interesting in light of what Peter said in Matthew 26, 33, when he said, even if all are made to stumble, Lord, I will never be made to stumble. Peter, do you love me more than these? Well, you know, Lord, on a previous occasion, I told you I did. Follow me? It could be looked at as a plural neuter. In other words, Peter, do you love me more than these fish? These things, we would say. Now, in our modern day vernacular, we might say it this way. Peter, do you love me more than you love anyone else on the earth? And do you love me more than anything else in the earth? Do you love me more than everyone and everything? Wow. Now, that's the supreme agapeo kind of love that Jesus is referring to here. And that, listen, gang, that is the question for each and every one of us today. How much do we love Jesus? Do we love him supremely? Do we love him more than anyone or anything Do we love him more than people in the world or the things of the world? In other words, are we putting Jesus Christ first and foremost in our lives? I like how Pastor Chuck puts it. What is our master passion? What drives us in the morning? What motivates us to get up and go, we might say? What are we putting first in our lives? You know, Jesus said in Matthew 6, 33, to seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So it's not a problem loving people or having the things of the world. That's not the issue. The question is, what are we putting first? What's the great love of our life? 
And that's the question that's posed to Peter. Well, notice the response in verse 15. Peter said to Jesus, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Now, Jesus used the word agapeo for love, a supreme love. Peter uses a totally different Greek word. It's the word phileo. It's only used 25 times in the New Testament. It means to like, to favor. It speaks of a brotherly love. We understand that from the word Philadelphia, Delphi city, phileo, love. It's the city of brotherly love. Not so sure today, but <laughs> that's what it's called. And Peter says, Lord, you know I like you a bunch. Now, before we get too hard on old Petey here, I think it's important to understand that Peter is probably not acknowledging a supreme type of love for Jesus Christ for fear out of making the same mistake he made in the past. You recall Peter denied Jesus. You recall Peter very pridefully said that even though everyone else is gonna be made to stumble, Lord, <laughs> this is me, you won't have any problems here. Hey, are you kidding me? That's pride, that's arrogancy. And it could be that Peter was very humbled at this point and he was not willing to make the same mistake twice. So he simply said, Lord, you know I like you a lot. I'm not so sure at this point in my life if I can say I, I supremely love you, that I'm putting you first and foremost above everything. Lord, I don't think I'm quite there yet. Follow me? And I'll tell you, this really blesses my heart because I don't think any of us have arrived. Okay, that was pretty weak. We all have a long, long way to go as it pertains to our Christianity, our walk with the Lord. Look, we're all very messed up people. Okay, three of us, good. <laughs> and I think it is very presumptuous and very arrogant and prideful of us to think that somehow we have arrived and that somehow our love for the Lord is, is better and higher than anything and anyone. Though hopefully that's our aspiration. Hopefully that's what our desire is. That Lord, I, I, I want to put you first. Lord, I want to love you above and beyond everything and everyone. So notice Jesus' response to this question at the end of verse 15. He said to him, feed my lambs. Now get the picture. Previously, in the earlier section, Jesus fed Peter with his own fish and bread, not Peter's fish and bread. The definite article was used before the word fish and bread in the previous section. So it wasn't the 153 large fish that Peter and the boys caught. Jesus fed them with his food as an example so that they in turn could feed others. And now Jesus is telling Peter to feed my lambs. The word lamb is the diminutive form of the word sheep. It's speaking of little sheep, or we, or we would say lambs. Now in the context, by way of application, sheep and lambs are used synonymously with the church, believers, in fact, in John chapter 10, verses one through 16, Jesus goes to great length to validate that. So all of us are sheep or lambs. Now in the context, it's speaking of little sheep or lambs, which deals with young believers, not necessarily chronologically, but spiritually. We might say those who are new believers, those who've recently come to faith in Christ. Peter is now being commissioned to feed them like Christ fed him. What an example. Question, how do we feed God's lambs, God's sheep? Well, it's with God's food. That's the example that Christ set. And for us, it's the word of God. That's the bread of life. In fact, Jesus said in John 6, I am the bread of life. And therefore, we place great importance on teaching the Word of God. That's the food for the soul, the food for life. 
And that's why the focus is on the word because that's our nourishment. That's, there's where we get our nutrients to grow and mature into sheep, we would say. Well, let's come to the second question. The second question is different from the first. In fact, all three questions are different. Uh, in verse 16, the second question is asked to him a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Now, he uses the same word for love here, agapeo, uh, but with an obvious difference, he drops a little phrase, more than these. So in the second question, Jesus is driving home the point that the whole issue deals with love love. So in verse 16, he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Once again, Peter uses the word phileo. You know, Lord, I, I love you like a brother. I, I like you a lot. So Jesus said in verse 16, tend my sheep. First, it was feed his lambs. Now it is tend his sheep. The word tend that's used here is the word poima ino. It's used 11 times in the New Testament. It means to watch over, to govern, to rule, to protect. It comes from the root word poimain, where we get our English word shepherd. In fact, that word is often translated in scripture, pastor. So the pastor, the shepherd, is one who not only feeds the little lambs, the word of God, so will grow and mature and become sheep, but he also is the one who governs or watches over and protects the flock in general. And this is the point that Jesus is making to Peter, which brings us to the third question, and that's in verse 17. Question number three, he said to him a third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? You say, Clark, I thought you said all three questions were different. This question seems exactly the same as question number two. It is not. Why? Because Jesus, in question number three, does not use his word for love, agapeo. He changes it and uses Peter's word for love, phileo. You say, well, why would Jesus change the word for love? That is a great question. And it would seem that Jesus is here coming down to Peter's level. Jesus is meeting Peter right where he's at. And I got to tell you, this really blesses my heart if indeed that's the case. And I believe it can be. Why? Because it doesn't matter where we've been or what we've done. It doesn't matter what our past holds. Jesus Christ meets us right where we're at. He comes down to our level, we might say. You know, we don't clean up our act and come to Christ. We come to Christ so that he can clean up our act. He meets us right where we're at. No matter how rotten and terrible we may have been, Jesus is standing here with open arms according to Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28 saying, come unto me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest for your soul. And what a beautiful picture this is of Jesus reaching down to Peter on his own level. Well, according to verse 17, Peter responded, it says he was grieved because he said to him a third time, do you love me? And he, of course, said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Now, it's no wonder that Peter was grieved when Jesus asked him this question three times. Because back in Mark 1441, in the Garden of Gethsemane, G Peter was asleep three times when he was told to pray. In Matthew 26, 75, Peter denied Jesus three times, just as the Lord said he would. So it's no wonder he was grieved when Jesus asked this question a third time, because he remembered his past failures. And yet in all of this, Peter still refer, uh, 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 replied in the affirmative, yes, Lord, I love you. Have I fallen short in the past? 
Oh, yes. Have I denied you? Absolutely. Have I done th things that I shouldn't have? You betcha. But Lord, you know I love you. And I think it's important for us to note that while we make mistakes in the past, while we fall terribly short in hindsight, that we remember our failures. Why? So we don't repeat them in the future. Now, I understand this idea about forgetting the former things. I, I get it, believe you me. And, and the past is the past, and we need to look forward. God's doing a new thing in our heart. I get that. But I think it is important for us not to dwell on the past, but at least once in a while to remember our shortcomings and our failures so we don't repeat them in the future. And so Jesus asked three times, three times, no doubt jogging Peter's memory to the past so he won't fail in the future. And then he said in verse 17, feed my sheep. Feed my lambs, tend my sheep, now feed my sheep. In other words, Peter, it really doesn't matter if you agapeo me or if you phileo me. It doesn't matter if you put me supremely or you just like me a lot. I want you to serve me. I want you to serve me by shepherding my flock. I want you to feed them. I want you to love them. I want you to tend, watch over and protect them. You know, as I thought about that, I couldn't think about how blessed we are here at the barn to have so many wonderful pastors, so many wonderful shepherds who love us, who feed us, who take care of us, who watch over and protect us. And this is what Jesus is calling Peter to be. One of these shepherds. He's still a sheep, by the way. He's still stinky and smelly and pretty dumb. <laughs> but yet God is going to raise up this man to be one of the pillars of the church, to be a leader, a shepherd, a shepherd of the flock of God. And the whole point here, family, is very simple. Our service to the Lord needs to flow out of our love for the Lord. Do you love me, Jesus said. If you love me, serve me. Tend my sheep, feed my flock. Minister one to another. And I think for you and for me, the point is very important. If we are serving the Lord, for any other reason other than our love for the Lord, we should probably stop. We should probably sit down. If we are feeling compelled to serve through obligation or some heavy handedness or some program or campaign that's really causing us to serve rather than just a heart of love for the Lord. And I remember that old hymn we used to sing at Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, many years ago. I will serve you because I love you. And you know, hopefully that's the desire of all of our hearts. Lord, I love you so much that I want to serve you. I want to be used by you. Well, back to John chapter 21. Let's come to the second thing we want to look at, we said there were four things dealing with our service to the Lord. Number one, it involved love and our service to the Lord should flow out of our love for the Lord. But the second thing involves sacrifice. Sacrifice. That's in verses 18 and 19. And the point here is very simple. Our service to the Lord involves sacrifice to the Lord. And in verses 18 and 19, there are two areas that are mentioned two areas of sacrifice as it pertains to serving our Lord. Number one, first of all, it involves our life literally. Our life literally. Look at verse 18 in the beginning of verse 19. Jesus, still talking to Peter, said, most assuredly I say to you, 
When you were younger, you girded yourself and walked wherever you wished. You did what you want. You went where you want. But when you are old, when you're going to get old, Pete, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. Now this he spoke signifying by what death he would glorify God. So our service to the Lord involves sacrifice. And here it speaks of our life literally. Jesus is prophesying about Peter's death. Peter, do you love me? Serve me. If you really love me, understand this, you are going to die for me. Now in about 40 years, when Peter writes 2 Peter, in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 14, Peter remembers the words of our Lord, and he talks about his impending death. In fact, two of the early church fathers, Tortullius and uh, Eusebius, they declare that Peter was crucified. However, Peter refused to be crucified in the normal manner. He asked to be crucified upside down because he wasn't worthy to be executed in the same fashion as his Lord. And the whole point here is, Peter, if you love me and serve me and live for me, understand you're going to die for me. Now, I realize this is a very foreign concept to us. We can't fully comprehend dying for our faith in Jesus Christ. Now, many of you have traveled around the world. You've been in countries where dying for the Lord is pretty prevalent. In fact, the voice of the martyrs have estimated that there are over 105,000 Christians martyred for their faith every single year. That's a pretty heavy statistic. And here you and I sit. Oh, sure, they say terrible things about us, and they cut us off on the freeway and make obscene gestures, and, and they badmouth us at work, and they, you know, uh, persecute us as it pertains to our facility. Oh, sure, big deal. What is that? Well, it's really nothing compared to losing your life for Jesus Christ. And one area of sacrifice that Jesus talks about involves our lives literally. But there's a second area that's mentioned, and this speaks of our lives practically. Practically. Look at verse 19 again. At the end of the verse, it says, And when he, Jesus, spoke in this, he said to him, Peter, follow me. Follow me. Now back in Matthew 4.19, Jesus told Peter to follow me. And he did. He left everything. He left family, friends, the fishing business to follow Jesus. He was willing to sacrifice. Listen, he was willing to sacrifice what he wanted to follow the Lord. He sacrificed his own desires his own wants, his own goals to follow Jesus Christ. And I believe this is exactly what the Lord desires for us. He desires for us to follow him. Sacrificially, oh, we say we love the Lord. In fact, we might even be in service for the Lord. But the question is, what's it costing us? Where's the sacrifice? You know, Jesus said in Matthew 8, 34, he said, if anyone will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Denying himself speaks of his life practically. Taking up his cross speaks of his life literally. Dying to self. Now, please don't misunderstand. I, I don't think we should all sell our homes, quit our jobs, and move to the mountains and sing Kumbaya all day long, though I'm not opposed to that. But what we are saying is, look, at work, at home, at school, at play, man, whatever we're doing, at our jobs, our careers, everything, man, just focused on Jesus. 
putting Jesus first in the workplace, at school, at home, in the marketplace, around the community, realizing that the things of this world are, well, they come and they go. Sometimes we have a bunch of it, sometimes we don't have much of it at all. But it's okay because we're willing to sacrifice everything for the Lord. And I have found this true in my life, and you probably have true too, is that we're, when, when, when we're willing to hold everything with that open hand and say, Lord, I'm gonna give it all to you. I really don't care about it. That's typically when God says, okay, fine, now you can hang on to it. <laughs> now you can keep it. Now that I know you really don't want it, you don't care about it. Now that I know you're putting me first above it just keep it so it's not about giving up everything it's just about being willing to give up everything and putting Christ first in our lives well let's come to the third thing we want to look at number three the third thing involves focus we said our service to the Lord involves love, sacrifice, but number three, it involves focus in verses 20 through 23. And the point here is very simple. Our service to the Lord involves staying focused on the calling of the Lord. Whatever God's called you to do, that's what we need to stay focused on doing. And we would mention two things in this third section. The first thing involves the problem of Peter. The problem of Peter. Uh, now, Peter had a lot of problems, it's true. But one that's mentioned here is very obvious. Take a look. It's his focus. In verse 20, it says, Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved, presumably John, who wrote the gospel. He was also the one who leaned on the breast of Jesus at the uh, upper room supper and said, Lord, who is it uh, who's going to betray you? Peter saw him and said to Jesus, here it is, but Lord, what about this man? Now get the picture. Here is Jesus. He pulls Peter and says, look, Pete, here's what I want you to do. I want you to feed my lambs. I want you to tend my sheep. I want you to feed my sheep, and I want you to follow me. Four things, Peter, I want you to do. And no sooner... After Jesus tells Peter to what to do, Peter turns and looks at somebody else and says, but Lord, what about him? <laughs> Peter got his focus off what he was supposed to do and on to others. You know, it's easy to look at what others are or are not doing because they're so messed up, amen? <laughs> now, you don't have to nudge the person next to you at this point. But it is so easy for us when we are called by God, do this, do that. We begin to look at other people and wonder why they aren't doing something. Well, what are you doing? Or why aren't you doing what I'm doing? That's the problem Peter had. He got his focus off of what he was supposed to do and on to somebody else. I like how Sally puts it. She talks about running in your own lane. I like that analogy. God's put you in a lane and you run. You don't look to the left or look to the right to see what the other runners are doing. You just run in your lane because you're looking at the finish line. And when you begin to look at the person next to you, you get off course, you get off track. And I don't know about you, <laughs> but I got enough things going on in my life without worrying about you. what you are or are not doing. Which brings us to the second point. And that is the proclamation for Peter. You might not like this. Look at verses 22 and 23. The proclamation for Peter. In verse 22, Jesus said to him, Peter, if I will that he, John, remain till I come, if he's going to live until the second coming for thousands of years, what is that to you? You follow me. Now this saying was a rumor, it went around among the other disciples and brethren that John wouldn't die, yet Jesus never said to him he wouldn't die. But if I will that he will remain till I come, what is that to you? Now don't miss this, twice, twice. It's recorded, what 
is that to you? Now that's the proclamation for Peter. Peter, here's what I want you to do. But Lord, what about him? Peter, mind your own business. That's what Jesus is telling him. Everyone okay? Why are we up in everybody else's business all the time? I, this is amazing to me. I don't get it. I really don't. I don't care about your business. I got enough stuff going on in my life. I'm not worried about what you are or are not doing or what you're saying or thinking or believing or who's saying what or who, who's acting this way. Or I, You know, I really don't care. And really, mind your own business. That's what Jesus is saying. Now, I told you you weren't going to like this one. <laughs> but it's so true. Look, in our service for the Lord, we need to stay focused on our calling of the Lord. It's so easy for us to get off track. What's God called you to do? Do it. Don't worry about anybody else, what they are or are not doing, what they're saying or what they're not saying, how involved they are or are they not. It really doesn't matter. Just stay focused on what God has called you to do. And that's the simple point that Jesus is making. Well, let's come to the fourth and final thing and we'll wrap this up right here. We said our service to the Lord involves love, sacrifice, and focus. But number four and finally, it involves truth. It involves truth. Look at verses 24 and 25. It says, this is the disciple, speaking of John, who wrote the book. This is the disciple who testifies of these things and wrote these things, and we know, apparently his secretary's pinning this little uh, postscript here, and we know that his testimony is true. So our service to the Lord involves speaking truth about the Lord. What was John called to do? Oh, he was called to write this gospel. So Pete, you know, <laughs> don't worry about John. He's got plenty to do. In fact, he's going to go on to write 1st and 2nd and 3rd John. And above that, he's going to be exiled on a little island called Patmos for a long time. And there he's going to write the book of Revelation. John's going to be plenty busy, Peter. Don't worry about him. John's going to be busy speaking the truth. You see, our service for the Lord involves speaking truth regarding the Lord. And I think this is <laughs> illustrated with a bit of hyperbole in verse 25. Take a look. It says, and there are also many other things that Jesus did, no doubt about that, which if they were written one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Wow. So apparently what John wrote is simply a selective list of things, not an exhaustive list of things. And here's some hyperbole is thrown in to drive that point home regarding the truth about Jesus. And this fourth and final point is huge, gang. Because our service for the Lord involves speaking truth about the Lord. And you and I are called to be those who speak the truth about Jesus. We're to be those disciples that are called to go forth and make other disciples, Matthew 28, 19, and 20. We're to be those who go about telling others about Jesus. You say, well, you know, Clark, I, I understand that, but, you know, I, I don't um, know the Bible very well. I, I'm really not very versed in Scripture. I, I, I can't talk very good. I, my English is terrible. Hey, join the club. But, you know, it's not always about what we say. But it is always about what we do. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 5, 16, that we should let our light so shine among men that they will see our good works, not our good words, but our good works, and glorify our Father in heaven. And I hope and pray that like Peter and John, we too are those who are in service for our Lord, that we do it out of love, we do it 
sacrificially. We do it with a heart that's focused on Jesus. And we always speak the truth in love. Father, how thankful we are. Lord, for these few short minutes you've given us to come together to study your word. And Lord, as John closes out his book, I too say amen, Lord. Let it be so. Let it be so in each and every one of our lives that we would be those disciples who tend your lambs, feed your sheep, tend your sheep, that we would be those who follow you. Lord, strengthen us by power and might. Through the inner man, by your spirit we pray that our life would be lived to bring glory to you. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Amen. Shall we all stand together? If you need prayer for anything at all today, uh, the pastors will be up front to pray with you, pray for you, just to minister to whatever need there may be in your hearts and lives today. So don't leave until you get some prayer. Man, laying it at the foot of Jesus. <coughs> Next week, Lord willing, we start the book of Acts. <coughs> Read ahead. It's only 28 chapters. You should buzz through it in a couple of sittings. So read it at least three or four times before our study begins next week. And uh, study the Word. Allow God's Word to sink into your hearts, into your lives. Man, just meditating on it day and night. Let it be that river of water that quenches your soul. God bless you guys. I love you. Have a have a great week in the Lord.